either put on these glasses or start eating that trash can. Roddy Piper, man, wasn't he the best? I don't consider it hyperbole or exaggeration to call Piper the best example of a wrestler who made the leap to acting. No, he didn't draw as much money or become as mainstream as guys like John Cena, Batista, or The Rock today. And Hulk Hogan may have been terrible, but his career was always seen as a much bigger deal. But if you just look at the Hot Rod's IMDB page, it's obvious he put in the work and committed to his craft like anyone else would. The number of film and TV credits he had, the range of roles he played, the people he worked with, I mean, no pun intended, but the man is an icon. I have certainly poked fun at a few of his projects over the years, but Piper was usually the best or most interesting part of those things, and his performances were a credit to the production. Now don't get me wrong, I don't think I ever saw anyone but Roddy Piper in those performances, but he never fell out of place, and that's sort of the cool thing about who Roddy Piper was. Whether he was a wrestler or an actor, a face or a heel, he was so genuine in everything he did or said that you believed it. Whether he was lively, somber, happy, enraged, reserved, out to lunch, he always came off as authentically him. But let's cut to the chase. Why is Roddy Piper the best wrestling actor of all time? Because he was in They Live! I've been so excited to look at this film as up until recently for this review, I'd never seen it before. After hearing so much about it and knowing all the memes and the pop culture references and given my line of work, it was inevitable I'd get to look at what many consider to be Piper's greatest work in cinema. Based on a five page short story by Ray Nelson, later turned into a comic book called Eight O'Clock in the Morning, John Carpenter's 1988 film They Live sees Piper playing a homeless drifter who discovers a terrifying secret about the American ruling class thanks to a special pair of sunglasses. Like a lot of Carpenter's work, the film didn't receive rave reviews at the time, but has since gone on to be more appreciated as time goes on thanks to its cult following. The movie is part science fiction, part social and political commentary. Carpenter's made it clear that They Live was a direct response to President Ronald Reagan's economic policies and the culture of consumerism. But perhaps unsurprisingly, this 34-year-old movie gives off some serious... now vibes. They lost 14 banks in one week. Hmm. Our owners, they have us. They control us. Hmm. He told me they got some sort of cult up there. End of the world kind of stuff. Hmm. We gave the steel companies a break when they needed it. Know what they gave themselves? Raises. Mm-hmm. But enough background and prep work. It's time for us to put on our sunglasses and expose ourselves to the truth. Let's dive into They Live. Spoiler alert, there will be spoilers. The film opens with Piper, who's nameless throughout the movie, but is referred to as Nada during the end credits, making his way to the next town looking for work. If you love the opening music composed by Carpenter and Alan Howarth, then you'll no doubt love when they play it about 93 more times throughout the movie. The film makes it very clear early on where it stands on the vapidness of celebrity worship. All I ever have to do is be famous. People watch me, and they love me. Ah, my nightly affirmation. A man with an ambiguous past, Nada comes to a construction site where he's hired and befriends another worker named Frank Armitage, played by Keith David. This is not the same Frank Armitage who wrote the screenplay for the movie, as that was just John Carpenter under a pseudonym. Just his little nod to H.B. Lovecraft. Just as Bill's over on 4th Street, they got hot food and showers. I'm going that way if you want me to show you. Mm, you know what? Doesn't matter what he says, I'm just glad we get to hear that smooth voice of his. That night at the homeless camp where Frank lives, Nada notices something bizarre happening with the TV broadcast, and to them. Their intention to rule rests with the annihilation of consciousness. Thank you. Bring the blue. The hacker explains that scientists have discovered signals in the airwaves that subliminally enslave the human population. Yeah, dude, it's called television. You don't need some nefarious hidden signal to keep my kids glued to it, am I right? As this primitive version of InfoWars tries to hack into the airwaves, Nada notices some suspicious looking activity at the nearby church. The next day, he sneaks inside to investigate where it looks as if they're making Orange Cassidy merchandise. He figures out that the man who helps run the camp is working with the people trying to broadcast their message. Nada warns Frank that something shady seems to be going on inside the church, but Frank doesn't want to go near it out of self-preservation. My line's in the middle of the road. It's the worst place to drive. 
Damn, that's a perfect metaphor and great practical advice for when you're driving. They don't make one-liners like this anymore. That night, the homeless camp is raided and destroyed by the police. The church ransacked and members of the movement violently beaten. Nada returns to the church to grab a box from a hidden compartment and discovers that it's full of nondescript black sunglasses. Finally, the movie takes a sharp turn when Nada puts on the sunglasses and sees a monochrome world and all the billboards, magazines, food packaging, and more replaced with messages like obey, consume, and reproduce. Yes, yes, Mr. Carpenter, we hear your message loud and clear. But that isn't all the glasses showed as Nada finally looks and sees... What's your problem? Oh, God, the horror. Uh, seriously, though, what does he really see? What's your problem? Oh, God, no, 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 seriously, what's the actual thing? What's your problem? Oh, well, that's not nearly as scary by comparison. Nada discovers that roughly half the people around him are actually some freaky skull-faced aliens who secretly live amongst humanity. These are the they the title refers to if you're still unsure. After uttering a line that I'm sure we'd all be thinking in that exact same moment, it figures it would be something like this. Nada starts to go full piper on an alien in disguise. You look like your head fell on the cheese dip back in 1957. Put him back on from Maldehyde face. You know what you need? You need a Brazilian plastic sword. And <laughs> what? Nada's behavior catches the wrong kind of attention from the aliens, which gets him a two-star wanted level and a confrontation with the alien cops. <laughs> Boom! Hell yeah! Great short on clothesline! Nada wastes the aliens and takes their weapons, then ducks away into the closest building he can find, which happens to be a bank chock full of baddies. Then it's time for the best line of the whole movie, the iconic one, the one everyone knows. Hey, 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 you f***ing Nazi! How are you? Eh, close enough. After Nada flees the police, the movie dips into the old kidnap an innocent woman and make her part of your plan trope. The woman's name is Holly Thompson, played by Meg Foster, who may have the iciest blue eyes in the history of cinema. Holly works for Cable 54 and is seemingly an unwitting agent of alien propaganda. Nada implores Holly to try the glasses on, but instead she makes him try the broad side of that champagne bottle. <laughs> Oh, I smell a romance! At one point, Nada walks past a wall of screens showing what I think is meant to be his mugshot, but just looks like a promo picture from three years earlier. Good luck finding him, since Piper's kind of unrecognizable once he's off the gas. Nada lucks out and grabs a couple of last pairs of sunglasses from the trash he hid them in before running into Frank once again. One week's pay. It's the best I could do. Oh, I hope they nailed that in the first take. Nada wants Frank to put the sunglasses on, but he vehemently refuses, which leads to one of the longest, greatest fight scenes in movie history. It's a scene that's been parodied and referenced a ton, and for good reason. What a shock that it would involve a pro wrestler whose primary offense was brawling. Man, I'm sorry. Man. Yes. Fuck. <laughs> I just love that they kept Piper's laugh there. Nada finally wins the tussle and forces Frank to wear the specs and see the truth. This next part where the two men, beaten down and exhausted, slowly ambling their way to a room is a great bit of understated comedy. Ain't love grand. Ooh, and look at this establishing shot. If you look closely, you can make all kinds of wrestling references, like Hardy, or Regal, or Broadway? Um, it's a bad looking street, so, you know, bad street? Oh God, that was terrible. Nada begins to open up to Frank about his traumatizing past as they wonder how long the aliens have been among them, making everyone turn on each other for their own selfish needs. Eventually, Gilbert finds our heroes and tells them all about the anti-alien resistance. At the next meetup, the boys upgrade from sunglasses to contact lenses. Hey, got him in on the first try, nice. The leaders explain that humans are joining the side of the aliens under the promise of a jump in social status and wealth. Nada finds Holly at the meeting, who has apparently joined the cause. But guess who's coming in with a jump scare? The meeting is raided by the authorities, and everyone but Nada, Frank, and Holly are wiped out. Nada and Frank grab hold of one of the aliens' special teleporting wristwatches, which allows them to all jump directly to the alien's secret base. Why? Because movie. The lads come upon a grand ballroom full of aliens and their human collaborators, patting themselves on the back Barry Horowitz style for their efforts to take over the planet and killing the terrorists who tried taking them down. The gains have been substantial, both for ourselves and for you. 
the human power elite. <laughs> <laughs> this movie is um, science fiction, yes? Suddenly they're met by one of the homeless men of the camp from earlier, only now he's joined up with the baddies and is all spiffed up for the occasion. He takes Nada and Frank on a grand tour of the facility. You think that's something? Take a look at this. It has to do with some sort of gravitational lens deal. Uh bend in the light or some damn thing. I'm not sure the movie really needed an explanation as to how the aliens got here, especially when this scene feels that the folks are just casually coming and going like it's a bus station. It's actually the least menacing part of the movie. Looks kind of nice. And here we got the brains of the whole operation. Um, I'm sorry, this story takes place over how many days? How fast did that guy get assimilated into alien culture for him to have all this access to their massive base? Also, how are Frank and Nada not killed on the spot just for being there? Our heroes have seen enough and have decided to head up to the roof to stop the alien signal. The former drifter warns that it's useless to fight and that humans will be left alone if they just help out the invaders. He also utters a line that John Carpenter says was lifted from a Universal Studios exec who didn't understand the crux of the film's plot. What's the threat? We all sell out every day. Might as well be on the winning team. So anyway, they start blasting, taking out every alien they can find in the TV studio as they make their way to the roof. Cool entrance fog. Security 950. Lock the elevators down. They're on the move. Ah, the old PKE meter makes another appearance. Looks like something else Piper and Hulk Hogan have in common. Nada reunites with Holly and they head to the top of the building, but alas, the jig is up as Holly reveals herself to be another human collaborator. But should we really be surprised? I mean, she was living in the Hollywood Hills on a TV salary. Come on. Nada goes to shoot the satellite, but Holly tries to stop him. Realizing this is the end of the road, he kills Holly and destroys the satellite before he's gunned down by the helicopters circling above. Boy, lucky for him, it only took two shots. Had the film ended there, it would have been appropriate and might have been seen as somewhat nihilistic, but instead the film wraps up with that subtle humor that helped carry the film along. With the signal destroyed, we see people all around the world reacting to the aliens suddenly being in their midst. Man, you think you know a guy. Hey, what's wrong, baby? And that was They Live. And if you'll pardon me for one minute, before we go any further, I have to check something real quick. Ugh, that is scary. Though it was largely met with a shrug upon its release, They Live has stood the test of time, considered to be one of Carpenter's best films, and perhaps still the best performance by a pro wrestler in a film. Part of what makes it an all-time classic is just how well its commentary holds up more than three decades later. Its warnings of the dangers of unrestrained capitalism and its portrayal of the wealthy elite as indifferent or downright hostile toward the homeless and anyone who tries to disrupt the system is as relevant now as it was during the Reagan administration. Piper delivers a great performance that really should have led to an even bigger acting career for him, but if he was able to make his imprint on pop culture with just one line, then I'm glad it was his famous odd bubblegum quip, a line that he had written himself in a notepad that was full of promo zingers. His chemistry with Keith David was fantastic, and at a brisk 90 minutes even, the movie never feels like it drags. They Live is as disturbing as it is timeless, as sobering as it is nostalgic, and best of all, Roddy Piper kicks ass in it, no bubblegum required. Uh, but it's important to point out that not all of Roddy Piper's acting credits are classic. At least, not for the right reasons. <laughs> That's right, folks. In two weeks, we're heading to Frogtown. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.